So a key thing here, we're doing, gonna do the second derivative test. The second derivative up till now, what we've done with the second derivative is found out where things were concave up and concave down. That's what the second derivative, us, derivative tells us, but that's not what the second derivative test is. Both the first derivative test and the second derivative tests are about finding maximums and minimums. Now, just to recap with our first derivative test, our first derivative test is where we found out where the first derivative was equal to zero. So we set our first derivative equal to zero and found out those critical points. We made our sign diagram with those critical points and non-permissible values, and then found out whether the graph was increasing when it was positive, decreasing when it was negative, and increasing when it was positive again. So we could say with the first derivative test that we would know that this point is a local maximum because the first derivative is equal to zero and because it was increasing before and decreasing after. So with those two things, we could say that that's a maximum. And we could say that this is a minimum by saying it was decreasing before and increasing afterwards. So those two things together made the first derivative test and we could tell which one was a maximum and which one was a minimum. The second derivative test is another way to find out where things were maximums and minimums. Okay. What the second derivative test does, it again starts off with the same thing that the first derivative test does. It finds out whether the first derivative is where it's equal to zero. So again, that's a key thing to find out if something's a maximum or a minimum. You need to find that f prime of x is equal to zero. But then in the second derivative says, instead of doing this second part, the sine diagram, instead of doing that, what we're going to do instead is just check what the second derivative is equal to at that point. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to label this one x1 and x2, just to, just to talk about the same points. What you're going to find out now is you're going to plug in those critical points into your second derivative. And what you're going to find out is when you plug in x1, which we know is a local maximum, when you plug that into, into your second derivative, you're going to get something that's negative, less than zero. And because it's negative, you know it's concave down. Does it make sense that the only way you can have the first derivative, your tangent, zero, which is horizontal, and if your second derivative says it's concave down at that point, that it must be a maximum. Does that make sense? Okay. So instead of having to do before and after to find out it's a maximum like we did in the first derivative test, all we have to do is plug that value into the second derivative. If it's negative, we know it's a maximum. Same thing with the second point. If I plug in that second point into my second derivative, I would get a positive number. And that would tell me it's concave up. And if the first derivative is equal to zero, and the second derivative says that it's concave up, then the only way that can happen is if it's a minimum. So again, the second derivative test also, maybe we want write that in there, that it also tests for maximums and minimums. The second derivative test is not a test to find inflection points or concavity. It's another way of finding maxes and minimums. And it's just looking at 
if I know the first derivative is equal to zero and I plug a value into the, that value into the second derivative, if it's negative, I know it's a minimum. If it's positive, I know it's a maximum. Often the second derivative test is quicker. If you're just trying to find out if something's a maximum or a minimum, the second derivative test is often quicker than the first derivative test. If you're actually graphing something, you'll almost always do the first derivative test because it's easy. And it's the first thing you do anyways to find out where things are increasing and decreasing. And then you don't need the second derivative test. So here we're going to find the coordinates of the local maximums and minimums and points of inflection for this function. And we're going to use the second derivative test to show where they're going to be maximums or minimums. So a recap of what we have done so far. First thing we would look at is say to ourselves, does this have any non-permissible values? because those are critical points as well. And in this case, there's no non-permissible values. We're not taking square roots of negative numbers and we're not dividing by zero. So we can start by just taking the derivative. And we get 3x squared minus 12. If we set that equal to zero, factor out the 3. We get two critical points, x equals minus 2 and x equals 2. Now, normally, this is where we would do the first derivative test to find out where it's increasing and decreasing and increasing again, to find out where things are local mins and local maximums. I'm going to leave that for now, because in this case, it says use the second derivative test to show their maxes and mins. So I'm going to just do that directly. So with the second derivative test, the second derivative test, f double prime of x in this case, will be 6x. If we set that equal to 0, that happens when x is equal to 0. And if we made our sine diagram here at 0, before 0, we would get negative. So that would be concave down. And if we plug in a number after 0 into the second derivative, we get positive and concave up. So from this, I can already tell that negative 2 and 2, which one's going to be a minimum, which one's going to be a maximum. I can tell that we have a local max at negative 2 comma. And if I plug in negative 2 into my original equation, I'm going to get 21. Someone could double check that because I did that very fast. Probably made a mental math mistake. Why? Because, and this is a second derivative test, because f prime at negative 2 is equal to 0, and f double prime at negative 2 is less than 0. And you can see that right here. Everything less than 0 is negative. So f double prime of negative 2 is less than 0. In fact, we could find out what it equals exactly by plugging it in. 6 times negative 2 is negative 12. And since our second derivative is negative and it's concave down, the only way it can be concave down and equal to 0 is if you have a local max. Similarly, we can say that we have a local min at 2 comma negative 11. Again, second derivative test because f prime at 2 is 0. That means our tangent is horizontal. And f double prime of 2 is greater than 0. 
And so the only way that can happen is if you have a minimum there. In fact, again, if we wanted to plug it in exactly, you would get 12. So the second derivative test says, first of all, we still need to have our tangent horizontal. That's a necessity for a max or a min. But we found out that there are some times where a tangent's horizontal, where it was a stationary point of inflection. Stationary points of inflection are like what you have in an x cubed graph, where the tangent is still flat, but it's not a maximum or a minimum. So just finding out that the first derivative is zero isn't enough to say it's a maximum or a minimum. The second derivative test says that if you find out that the second derivative at that point is negative, it's concave down. And if it's concave down, the only way that that can be is if that point was a local maximum. And if you find that that point is concave up, the only way that it, it can be horizontal and concave up is if it's a local minimum. Zero comma five is an inflection point because we found out because f double prime of zero is equal to zero and it changes concavity so you can show something's an inflection point by showing that the second derivative is equal to 0 and that's not enough just to say that you have to say the second derivative is equal to 0 and it changes concavity. Or you might remember from before that we showed that the second derivative is equal to 0 and the first derivative didn't change sign at that point. But most people, for, for inflection points, show just that it changes concavity. Now I'm going to go back and add the first derivative test because it will be a natural thing for you to do. When you're solving these questions, you're going to do the first derivative. You're going to put your critical points on here. You're going to plug values back into your first derivative and find out where it's positive and where it's negative. So if I plug in something less than negative 2, like negative 5, this section will be negative. This section will be negative. Negative times negative is positive, meaning our function is increasing. Then between negative 2 and 2, pick something like 0. This one will be positive. This one will stay negative, making this section negative, going down. And finally, plugging in a larger number. Both of them will be positive, And it will be increasing again. So your first derivative test, it's really easy to see that negative 2 was a local maximum and positive 2 was a local minimum. But we could also see that with our second derivative test. Because at negative 2, it's concave down it has to be a maximum. At 2, it's concave up. It has to be a minimum. I'll scroll back down here. All right. Um, so what I like to do with these questions, I like to do my first derivative and my first derivative test. So there we factored it. You get 0 and 6. My nose negative, negative, and positive, so this function is decreasing, then decreasing again, then increasing. Then look at my second derivative test. Or not my second derivative test, but my second derivative. Sorry. Because this isn't my second derivative test. This is just showing where it's concave up and concave down. So we're finding out concave up, then concave down, then concave up. So we've got a couple of inflection points. So now I just have to classify which one of these are inflection points, which ones are maxes, which ones are minimums, and then I'm going to go to graph it. Another thing that I'm going to find helpful when graphing is if I have any x-intercepts or y-intercepts that I can find. For this one, if I want to find 
some y-intercepts, I can, I mean some x-intercepts, I can factor this. And I can factor out an x cubed and I find it's equal to 0 when x is 0 and x is equal to 8. So those will be my two x-intercepts. Plugging in 0 for x tells me my y-intercept is 0 comma 0, which you can tell from this as well. Now this is where I'm going to get wordy. I'm going to write out the first derivative test just like how you would explain the first derivative test. So what do I know? I know that 0, 0 is a stationary point of inflection because f prime of x is, or sorry, f of x is decreasing before x equals 0 and decreasing after x equals 0. I know it's equal to 0 at 0, but because it's decreasing before and decreasing after, it makes it a stationary point of inflection. I know that 6 comma negative 432, at this point you might have thought your numbers were wrong because they got so big. I know that that's a local minimum, and from the first derivative test, I know it's a local minimum because it's decreasing before and increasing after. So f prime of x is less than 0 before x equals 6, and it might have been nicer even to use that wording because it's decreasing before x equals 6, and f of x is increasing after x equals 6, but I did it by just using the derivative notation and saying my first derivative was negative before and positive after. And that makes it a local minimum. If I wanted to say that with the second derivative test, with the second derivative test, I would say 6, negative 432 is a local minimum because the first derivative is equal to 0 and the second derivative was bigger than 0. So if we look at our second derivative chart, 6 would happen somewhere over here and that makes it concave up. And if it was concave up and the first derivative was equal to 0, it must be a local minimum. When you plugged in f double prime of 0, or 0 into your second derivative, you got 0 again, which is neither positive or negative, which means that you can't say that it's a minimum or a maximum. All right, so putting everything in, we have 0, 0 as our stationary point of inflection. We've got 6, negative 432 as our minimum. When you plug in 4, you get negative 256. That's your inflection point. We found out at the top of the page that 8, 0 was another x-intercept. So now you just have to go and graph it. Again, you could start with your inflection points. This section's concave up, this section's concave down, this section's concave up again, going through all your maximums, minimums, and x-intercepts, and you get this graph as your final graph. 